Thanks, B. And I feel you see, this is one of the challenges, right? This is what we're talking about, connectivity, really literal and, and figuratively. Well, quite literally. Um, I would sort of take this uh, response to this question a few parts, try not to be too long-winded, but I would say in terms of challenges, you know, I would first that the larger challenges that the country is facing now and, and has been over things of COVID-19, this idea that really our most vulnerable populations uh, are really there a lot of uh, struggles and um, really inequities have been have been laid bare. Of course, they have been there, um, but along uh, the lines, income, accessibility, age, um, this is of course part of systemic racism that that um, has really put in place these inequities. So there's there's lots of bigger than the councils, I guess, to say. But in terms of specifically. Um, what's happening in three and how that affects councils, I would say this lack of connection, um, the erosion of trust, uh, and a deeply shaken sense of safety, right? So, and I think we're, I think many of us, if not all of us, are experiencing that. For councils specifically, the main vehicle that the council use is in-person events, public humanities uh, events, free and open to the public, and of course, getting there in person, those, all of those events have been, have been shuttered. The other challenge here is the need at the local level, right? So there's a sort of lack of accessibility and then the need that they are, that they are facing. Um, and I'd say that one way the councils have responded has been through the generosity of Congress, the National Endowment for the Humanities, state councils, got out the door $30 million in grant making to local organizations throughout the country in every corner of the country. Um, many of those grants were to support organizations to help uh, sustain them at this time. So councils have done the grant making. They have nimbly adapted to current environments as they do historically, compiling resources and podcasts and films for digital programming. They've adapted and redesigned some of their programs. Um, so that, of course, they're doing all of that. I would say the third part of this question is, what role do the humanities have to play this time more, more broadly? And I would say that the humanities obviously give us context, often some solace or comfort. I think of um, the uh, American Academy, um, Academy of American Poets, their poetry and shelter, shelter poetry readings online from incredible, incredible poets, so inspiring. But I would say also, and more importantly, even than context and comfort, is uh, that we can use the humanities to articulate what we um, at stake for our country in this moment. So for me, the humanities are this lens um, through which we can connect and build empathy and trust and understand one another. Um, and those are really, you know, some of the most important ways in which the communities can connect us at this time. Thanks, Phoebe. And I think that, you know, from, from our perspective, it was amazing to see how quickly the councils made that pivot. Um, it seemed like within the first days after the COVID shutdown, um, they had already figured out creative ways to get their programming online and were in very much conversation with each other to figure out best practices for that. Um, so yeah. uh, I also do want to mention, though, that there's non-virtual programming going on that they've also done. There's some letter link programs that have been happening before that have been adapted for for COVID kind of content. Um, but there's some you know, old old fashioned ways of connecting that have um, that councils have leaned on during this time. Um, yeah, I, the letter writing campaign or letter writing projects are really quite cool. Um, yeah. So while you're new to this role, you have been working in state councils for many years, um, first at the Illinois Council, as Steve mentioned, and then executive director of the Maryland Council for 12 years. Um, from your vantage point and your wealth of experience, um, can you talk more broadly about the roles that the humanities councils play in their states? Yeah, I mean, I think that, I mean, I see humanities councils as conveners, certainly catalysts. Um, distributors of information, but also engagers, listeners, probably most importantly, storytellers. Um, you know, it is this 
engagement with public audiences sort of for me where the humanities happen. So um, I, I talk very little about access because I think that implies that this, the humanities councils would have something that others need and we're opening the door. I don't see that. I see state councils working in and with communities. And then when we are engaging our community, you know, they have the knowledge, the communities as well, um, and it bring them uh, or sit with them, hear them, listen to them, um, either virtually or in person, that's where the humanities happen. Um, and I think that, you know, that role of bringing communities together to reflect uh, together and also to go to work in community to find out communities, find out what are the important issues uh, that they want to they want us. What's most important uh, for them? And how about on a national level, right? There's such key institutions in their state, but mm -hmm. we also know they come together nationally, support the federation. Yeah. What is so? What can councils do together? Yeah. So through the generous support of the Allen Foundation, the councils for the past, I want to say, four or five years have had a series of national initiatives um, where almost every state council has participated over those years, perhaps all of them. Uh, uh, so those have focused on the centennial of the Pulitzer uh, Prize, and then two uh, iterations of what's called Democracy and the Informed Citizen. Uh, so these are books that look at media literacy, the erosion of trust, um, between communities, people, and, and media outlets. Um, news, you know, how can we are discerning our sort of sources of, of information. So those have been uh, really nationwide, I would say thousands of programs nationwide on those topics, uh, involving journalists quite often, particularly the Pulitzer, uh, some of the Pulitzer Prize winners. And then we all had a really robust partnership uh, last year, the year before with the National Archives on the, um, I mean, maybe this was the 250th, I should know this, the Bill of Rights anniversary. Um, and the archives had a pop-up cardboard exhibit. Uh, I know when I was at Maryland, we had 48 libraries display this pop-up in school. So if you replicate that in, you know, 30, 40 other states, again, you have thousands of exhibits on the, on the meaning of the Bill of Rights uh, across the country. So we are, I would say the council's strength is certainly uh, their uniqueness and understanding being on the ground in their communities at that grassroots level. And um, then also they're a mighty force together as well. And of course, should say we also come together, of course, for our National Humanities Conference and then for our National uh, Advocacy Days on the Hill as well. Right. We get to follow up on your Humanities on the Hill Advocacy Day a week later and always benefit so much from the state councils being in the congressional offices and telling their yeah. story and then just getting to add on a bit. Um, and, and the councils have always done such a great job that we feel well positioned when we come in a week later. So um, we're, we wanted you to talk a little bit about how scholarly societies, higher ed institutions, and other mm -hmm. cultural organizations can partner with state councils to collectively deepen the public's engagement with the humanities. Some interesting models you've seen, general trends, things of that sort. Yeah, I mean, to be clear, uh, you know, we at the State Humanities Councils um, cannot do our work without the scholars, thought leaders. I mean, that isn't always a PhD. We certainly know that. Uh, lots of folks with, with deep knowledge um, that aren't based at a university but, or college, but uh, those partnerships are critical, critically important to the work that the State Humanities Councils do. Often they're board members also who sit on the boards of, of State Humanities Councils. And then, you know, I, in, in Maryland, uh, we partnered with a good number of community colleges to host our programs, uh, particularly our Chautauqua Living History programs. So this can also be a site uh, of the work that we do together. You know, how can we partner? I would say, you know, it's also reach out. I mean, I would say state humanities councils, not right now, but usually have a real life person who's answering the phone and a program officer who would love to talk to you about letting resources together, right? 
um, this is the content of the scholar's work that enlivens our conversations. So, um, you know, we work with the scholars and the higher ed institutions regularly. Uh, I would also say that although the Humanities Conference this year is canceled, much to our the in-person in event is canceled, the conference is also an ideal way, I think, to collaborate and learn about these cross, you know, cross uh, collaborations. Um, and that's fantastic. I will also say that, um, yeah, so I'll, I'll just finish there. I would say every day we are working together, but if you don't know your local state humanities council, be sure to be sure to reach out. Um, and we have, can put you in touch with anyone who you need. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna open it up for questions. Um, uh, if those of you who are watching could ask questions by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of the webinar screen and entering your question, that would be great. Um, so using the Q&A function at the bottom. Um, Can I also just say one more thing, B? Also, I really think, I just want to say a little bit something about working with scholars. It's really an authors and humanists. It's really a two street. Um, I find that scholars and humanists come uh, to me often and say that their lives were really changed immeasurably by doing the work in the public spaces. I'm just gonna give a really brief example. At um, Maryland Humanities, uh, we have a one book program. We chose a book, Warren St. John, who was formerly a New York Times reporter. He wrote a book called Outcast United, a refugee soccer team in the US and Georgia, wonderful book, fiction, you should all read it. But he wanted to do one of his book talks uh, at um, for folks who were incarcerated. So he wanted to go to a prison and give a talk and he had never done that. So we had a book club session uh, with a group of men at, at a prison in Maryland. And um, we had a full day packed and, you know, it go from there to lunch to the digital, you know. And he came out and he, said, I have to go to my hotel room now. Like that was a life-changing experience. I'll be back and meet up with you guys later, but I need to access what I just experienced. And he said, I just never could have gotten that kind of experience uh, anywhere else. And so I think, you know, you really can have, um, I think it can have a profound effect on scholars too doing this work. Um, thank you, that is a very, helpful example and I'm glad you included it. Um, so just as a first question, um, uh, many current uh, or recently finished graduate students are contemplating careers outside higher ed institutions. Mm -hmm. um, can you share how you made your way from a PhD uh, to Illinois Humanities? Yeah, um, I think you know it was a crooked line and not anything I had sort of planned, which is sort of how I find is. But actually, I was um, I had finished up um, my PhD and uh, I had taught throughout the year, and so I was not offered any teaching for the summer uh, because I had sort of fulfilled the number of courses that I could teach. So I worked as uh, a temp in a hotel uh, catering office. And I had been uh, to the, um, the year prior, I had been to go to the, um, the Humanities Festival in Chicago, doing my work and living in Chicago and finishing up my degree at Loyola there. And so I called up the festival after I went to the Humanities Festival and I said, do you guys have interns? And they said, we don't have anything open right now, but you might want to call Illinois Humanities Council. And I didn't even know what that was and the connection to the festival. So I went in. So I started as a summer intern um, at Illinois Humanities. Um, and actually, my first job there was to write the Schwartz Prize nomination um, for an Illinois Humanities project that actually won. But um, oh, that's how I did it, by making phone calls and sticking around. And then eventually some staff people left and some opportunities opened. But I was there as a part-time intern to begin with. I will say in terms of talking to my, you know, I had um, two different reactions from academia. Um, one, the, the, um, I was teaching in DePaul at that time. And when I described the opportunity that I was going to take, the chair of the department, <laughs> said, good for you, um, 
And then she leaned over and she said, take me with you. That sounds wonderful. I want to work there, you know, which she didn't. She went on to, you know, she was a star in her own field, but it was very cute. My dissertation advisors were not as excited for me to leave. So they had invested a lot of time and energy uh, in my work and my scholarship and my publishing. And so that was a different conversation, a little tougher. Yeah, it does seem to be that there's some change on that front um, in recent years, which is nice to see. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sticking on that topic just for a minute, um, what skills do you find that PhDs bring to councils mm -hmm. and other public organizations? I think that, um, well, I, I think an attention to detail, uh, curiosity, um, and uh, really, at least for me, kind of um, uh, wanting a really thorough understanding of the issues, of the problems, um, seeing the big picture and the, and the, atten the need for the attention to detail. Um, and, you know, I think that is part of graduate training. Uh, you know, there's a lot that isn't, I can't say that I use you know, my knowledge of my dissertation topic or anything daily, that, that's not it. Um, and I think nonprofit management is, is a skill set all of its own that really does need, I mean, and that's why I'm glad I started as an intern, then I was an entry level pen, then I was promoted, but I sort of worked in a lot of different seats at Illinois Humanities before I got to, to Maryland. And I, also my colleagues have been very, very generous and supporting me. I think the biggest trend was going from PhD feeling um, that I kind of made a contribution to a field and um, got a degree and then coming in as a very a new person who really did not know anything when I came into my internship at Illinois Humanities. And that was just challenging just because everyone was going, you know, these are incredibly wonderfully talented staff who are going a mile a minute. And uh, that was challenging, I would say, to go feeling like I had some expertise to feeling I didn't know a thing. I think that's a feeling many of us have experienced starting in a new job and especially making yeah. that kind of transition. Um, so when we started collaborating on the National Humanities Conference with the Federation, um, the goal was to foster collaboration across councils and the higher ed community. Mm -hmm. um, and also to foster learning. Um, as scholars in higher ed have become increasingly interested in publicly engaged work in recent years, what do you think they stand to learn from the councils who have been, since their inception, dedicated to public humanities work? Well, I'm glad to know and to see that um, I think there's a, I don't know, I think there may be less of a learning curve than there used to be, um, just because I think that academia has, has centered, to some extent, the public, the public piece and the public understanding. Um, and those folks who, because the conference really do believe in that. Um, I think, I would hope that the, the count, that the conference could be a source of future collaboration that um, we're no longer beginning the conversation with how in the world could we work together? It's more, okay, what do we want to build together? How can we advance together? Um, and, uh, and continue, I, I guess I also see it as continuing to foster this understanding of the central role for the humanities in public life, that we can do that, we can do that together. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's a tricky thing because lots of folks say to me, you know, oh, the humanities under fire, oh, humanities, and I certainly understand there are, of course, in academia, especially not knowing whether classes are going to reconvene or when or how or, you know, in departmental budgets, and I, I don't understand, you know, uh, I'm sure the half of that, but when I am going to council programs and I do as much as I can, um, online, I mean, the humanities are thriving. I was at a, um, a New Hampshire Humanities Council event with a scholar from university, I believe she was from the University of New Hampshire, talking about yellow fever and the, um, the racist stereotypes and assumptions 
that were perpetuated during yellow fever and the, the echoes today. And um, I think they had 130, 40, 50 people on a, on a Friday evening. So um, for me, the humanities are live and well and what people are hungry for. People stand in line as we all have for three hours to an author and get an autograph, you know, or get a signature or whatever we call it these days. So I think the humanities are a threat and I see it every day, so. Yeah, I think that is very reassuring. And I think that there have also been several pieces with an academic lens recently suggesting that um, within an academic context, students are going to be interested in these kinds of questions given the experience of the pandemic and given the mm -hmm. experience of um, trying to reckon with a history of racial injustice, um, that that may very well draw people to the humanities, um, even amidst the budget cuts that we are seeing concerns about. Sure. Well, if we are wondering emerging, and I'm no, no longer saying emerging out of the pandemic, I mean, um, and there's not post-pandemic, with pandemic, what it means to be as humanities are gonna be kind of your best source to, to think about that in this new world. Um, so this is back to the question of collaboration. Um, as you mentioned, scholars often sit on humanities council boards. Um, can you talk a little bit about what they bring to those conversations and how a scholar who's interested might get more involved in that, in that way? Mm -hmm. Well, interestingly, actually, um, council um, boards were predominantly um, uh, academics um, in the early days, which is now, you know, 40 years. In. Um, and I would say for lots of different reasons, we wanted, uh, councils want to mix up the mix of their uh, board, kind of board members, kind of background they had in their board members, bring on business leaders who certainly can be patent humanists, of course. Um, but I would say that, um, you know, the work there, I'll just give you one example. In Maryland, uh, there's a University of Maryland a college professor who teaches a course every year called, you know, Maryland Literature. Well, he found out, Randy Ontiveros, he found out that we had a walking tour, Baltimore's Literary Spots, and he started to bring his students on the tour, and he started tweeting about it, and then he started to be, he signed up to be a history judge with us, and finally I called him, I said, who is Professor Ontiveros, who's just spreading the good word about our work. I said, you know, you're getting yourself in trouble here. You're gonna wanna, I want you to join our board. You know? So um, I think there's a role to play with connecting the work that's going on in the classroom and showing how live outside. Um, and this, and I find that scholars are very excited about this larger mission of advancing the value of the humanities in everyday life. That, that's a, that is very exciting for, for some folks um, from the academy. Um, and I will just throw in that one of our favorite connection stories from the National Humanities Conference is a leader of a scholarly society who met her council board there and is now serving on the board. Yeah, and I shouldn't, I shouldn't, I also should say that, of course, there are folks in higher ed who are very involved in this work and have been for many, many years. I and mean, it's not, I'm not telling many people anything new. It's just these are the, these are that I see the, the connection. So. This is not a new engagement, it's just there, there can always be, I think. Um, okay, I'm going to throw you a last question that is forward looking. Um, what do you most look forward to once we can all gather together safely? Mm. I, well, I have to say, I, I look forward to, you know, good meal shared, um, talking about literature face to face, because I love literature, but I also really look forward to being in, in a space and working approximately with my colleagues, um, which doesn't mean we won't remote, work remotely on some days, but um, we had a couple colleagues go into the office to say to drop off a laptop and they sat far away and protected in the office space. And it nearly made me weep because it was I don't know, it's just something about them being in the office and being, being together and working on something even for a half an hour that, um, I mean, it sounds funny to say you're happy to go to the office, but I look forward to being proximate in, in the office and in community. Really, that's another thing. Yeah. Well, 
thank you so much, Phoebe, for joining us today. And thank you to everybody who called in. Um, we will be sending a link to the recording of this call in our next memo to members. And I hope that everybody will have the opportunity to meet Phoebe in person or virtually before that. Mm -hmm. um, and we will look forward to all gathering together in person eventually. Um, Thanks, Phoebe. Thank you so much. Um, and to everybody else, if you have any ideas for future programs or folks you'd like to hear from, please let us know and we will see you soon.